There is no denying that we have tested out a lot of 3D printers on this channel over the years. And some of them have been great. They've been really exciting with new features that I've never seen before. While other ones not so much and they've left a lot to be desired. During the midpoint of 2021, I started saying no to a lot of FDM 3D printer reviews just purely because they were a near identical version of a 3D printer we've already covered. And I like options as much as anybody. However, if it's not providing anything that's different as far as features or functionality, or at least providing something that makes it a better value, I just don't really see the point in covering it. Around four months ago, Quiditech reached out to me to see if I was interested in reviewing one of their 3D printers. And I was actually quite excited. I have heard a lot about their 3D printers over the years. Every time I've gone on Amazon, I've always seen them on there for a long time with really positive reviews. And anyone I've talked to that's actually owned one typically doesn't have very much negative to say about them. And additionally, most of their 3D printers that I've seen are fully enclosed, which is certainly not a common theme with printers we've tested out. They had recently released a beast of a machine that's right behind us, which is the Quiddy Tech iFast that had a lot of features I was really interested in seeing for myself. So they sent the machine in September. I've had it and have played around with it on and off for about three months now, and I've easily put a couple of hundred hours on it. And this printer definitely takes the cake for the biggest overall footprint of any printer we've tested, as well as the probably the most or one of the most pricey FDM 3D printers we've also tested on this channel. With that being said, this printer is by no means targeted as an entry level hobbyist 3D printer, and it really wouldn't be in the same conversation as something like a Creality printer. It's much more in alignment with something like an Ultimaker style printer or a Race 3D Pro 2 printer, and those start at, I believe, mid 3000s and can go up to six or seven ish thousand dollars fairly easily, depending on the configuration that you get. And compared to those, this is retailing at around $2,300-ish at the time of recording this and has much of what those printers have as well as some additional features that they don't have like an actively heated chamber. So in today's video, we will go over the specs of the Quiditech iFast. We will go over what the unboxing and setup was like. I will tell you guys and show you guys what I have printed on it and the very, very many materials that I printed on it. And I will give you sort of my final thoughts uh, over these past few months after having used this printer for all of the testing that I have done. This is by far the biggest review I've ever done to date and longest. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Like we typically do, let's first run through the specs of this printer. There are a lot of them, and there's actually quite a few things that weren't included anywhere on the product page that were a really nice surprise. The iFast has a build volume of 360 by 250 by 320 millimeters. It has dual direct drive hot ends and comes with two sets of them. One set is non all metal and is going to be for either dual printing with something like PLA or TPU or PLA and PVA. And then there is a completely separate tool head that has its own direct drive extruders and its own all metal hot ends with bimetal heat brakes and hardened steel nozzles that you can print just about anything on from abrasives and all the way up to something like polycarbonate, you will have no issues pushing filament through the high temp wear resistant extruder or nozzle assembly. That was the first thing that wasn't on the product page. Um, on the product page, when I got the printer, it said it had a dual brass, like the dual non all metal brass setup for PLA with PVA, and that it came with a single head that you can throw in there that had a ruby tip on it. So. To me, going from that, which is what I thought I was getting to, the new version where they decided to go with the dual bimetal and hardened steel nozzles was a pretty awesome upgrade that again, I wasn't expecting. The iFast uses a physical switch to raise and lower the two different hot ends out of the way of each other, which is far superior to dual extrusion setups with stationary hot ends. Uh, it's actually very similar to what the Ultimaker 3D printers use. So after it is printing one color and switching to the other color or the other material, it will go over to the side of the machine, hit a switch on top of the tool head that will then raise or drop the different tool heads depending on again, what it is that you're doing and what which head needs to be active. As far as wiring goes, there are two sort of beefy ribbon cables that go to the tool head assembly, which is quite nice because when you need to swap between the two different tool heads, if you're gonna print with PLA and then you're gonna print with something that's like abrasive or high temp, the swap out process is fairly simple. The X, Y, and Z axis use linear rails and the bed rides up and down using two lead screws. The printer does come with a magnetic flex plate system, which I am a huge fan of. It comes with a bed surface that's basically like a build tack, but 
kind of a knockoff build tack that does stick really well for PLA, but uh, in my experience, things stick too well with these types of sheets, and I actually did end up, in my three months of using it, destroy the top sticker, which luckily you can just replace. But they also include a powder-coated uh, PEI bed surface, which I've mentioned quite a few times is my absolute favorite bed surface to use. So that is what I primarily used after the initial printing. And that was also something not mentioned anywhere on the product page and is certainly a really cool addition to have. The iFast has manual bed leveling using a three-point system. I was a little bit disappointed that there was an automatic bed leveling. I just think that the with the big bed on this machine and sort of the cost and all of the other crazy bells and whistles that they sort of threw in, like, I just feel like they could have added a probe. So good news is once I did get this thing up and running and set up, it's quite stiff or rigid to the machine. So I didn't really have to adjust it very much or very often, but still it would have been really nice to have automatic bed leveling. The body of the iFast is made up of a ton of injection molded plastic, but it is reinforced with a thin steel frame. And I do feel like it is quite rigid and it is definitely needed considering it has a massive tool head that has a lot of weight to it because it is a dual direct drive setup. Inside of the printer, there is a carbon filter, which is always really nice to see and certainly not something common, and an actively heated chamber or element that can move heat around the chamber that can heat it up to 60 Celsius. This is a massive feature for anyone that wants to print high temp materials like ABS or polycarbonate or large nylon prints because it will help to ensure that there is minimal warping, which is always the biggest issue when you're printing with these materials that have a higher shrinkage rate and are more prone to warping. The primary companies I know that have actively heated chambers are Stratasys and MakerBot, which is also owned by Stratasys. They've had a patent on actively heated chambers for a very long time, which if I'm not mistaken, expired earlier this year. And so I was wondering, when it would be that we would start seeing 3D printers have heated chambers now that it, the plug gates are hopefully open. And it is really exciting to see it in a machine again at this price point when the only other machines I'm familiar with are two to three times the price that have something like that in them. At 60 Celsius, it's definitely not the hottest internal temperature I've seen. I've seen some machines that can get up to, I think, 90 Celsius, but they're more meant for printing with Peak or Ultim, which this is not targeted as a Peak or Ultim machine. But again, for the other uh, high temp materials that aren't quite that high temp like ABS, nylon, and polycarbonate, that 60 Celsius is really going to help. As far as printing options go, you can print over Wi-Fi, you can print over Ethernet, or you can use the built-in USB flash drive. I primarily used the Wi-Fi as well as the USB flash drive. There is a very large five inch touchscreen on the front of the machine that works very, very well. There are a lot of options and it did take me a little bit to get used to it because the user interface isn't exactly like some of the other touchscreens I'm used to using. But once I did get familiar with it, it worked really well and I would say it's quite intuitive. As far as the controller for this 3D printer, I actually don't know what's inside of it. I did try to crack open the machine like I normally do when I review a FDM 3D printer and I probably spent a good 20-ish minutes trying to take screws out of the plastic panel on this and I couldn't figure it out. And looking online, there was not a lot of information. However, based off all of the motherboards that Quiditech does have posted online for their current generation of 3D printers, they all are 32-bit boards. So I would be shocked if there wasn't also a 32-bit board inside of the iFast. It does look like most of the Quiditech machines are running some version of a Sailfish firmware and their firmwares are actually not really public facing. If you go on their website and you click on firmwares and uh, it'll list the latest firmware for each of their machines and say that if you need firmware to contact them and they will give you the latest firmware. So they are not very open about it and it seems like the development for the firmware is primarily a proprietary type thing that is done in-house. The iFast was very well packed and showed up in a big old box with a bunch of ties on it and the box had clearly taken a bit of a beating in transit but once I cut those ties and lifted off the box I saw that it was encased in foam externally and internally and it had a plastic wrap on it so there were no issues. Aaron was at work so I managed to get it on my workbench but at nearly 73 pounds it is definitely a team lift sort of machine. Along with the things I already mentioned that were included, I found two one kilogram spools of PLA plus, as well as a dry box that can be mounted onto the back of the machine for PVA or really any material that is prone to absorbing moisture. There was also a small container that included a few tools, replacement brass nozzles for the PTFE hot ends, and a few other spares. Setting up the printer was a fairly quick process that involved removing all the packaging and a few clips on the belts that kept the tool head from getting damaged in transit. After that, I was ready to power on the machine, navigate to the leveling, and run the recommended fast leveling. This involved me using the included leveling paper and baby stepping the bed 
bed from the screen until the nozzle was the correct distance away from the bed. It does have you go check both nozzles to make sure they are both the correct distance, and in my case, they were good to go. Once done, I was ready to load some filament and get printing. There are two spool holders built into the back of the machine that I really like. They do take up a bit of additional depth, but given the size of the machine, I feel like they're positioned in a way that has them out of the way yet accessible. The filament feeds from the spool holders through a cavity on the top back of the machine, which is where it passes through the filament runout sensors. And I did notice that once it passes through those sensors, there's a bit of a pull or drag on the filament, and it didn't seem to cause any issues in my time printing with it, but I do think that if they had lined it with something like PTFE, it probably would have been a much better design choice. When it was time to load the filament into the hot end, I pressed the in button and I was expecting it to heat up or tell me, hey, you've got to heat it up first. And it didn't, it had no problem trying to load uh, filament through a cold hot end. So I ran over to the computer, sent an email off to the team, letting them know, hey, this is not good. This needs to be patched in a firmware update because it could cause something to, you know, cause damage in the hot end and they did let me know they were going to reach out to their devs, and I don't know that I got an official update that it's patched, but it seemed like it should be taken care of. Once the hot end heated up, I took the hood off of the machine to load in that red PLA+. Plus. I actually left the hood off for the entire print. They recommend leaving it off for PLA and TPU at least, because the heat does build up in there, even if you're not running the heated chamber, and PLA does not need that, so it will help to prevent something like heat creep. Next, I plugged in the flash drive to see if there were any test files. The uh, port for the flash drive is right by the handle of the door, which is probably the worst design choice out of everything on this machine. I, I just don't understand. There are so many things that they did really, really well with this machine, but having a flash drive right here on the front is just an accident waiting to happen. And I think that really anywhere else on the top of the machine would have been a better choice. But since that's not the case, I would at least recommend they sell flash drives that are really, really short that barely stick out at all. I would highly recommend investing in one of those just to prevent an accident from happening. Happening, But yeah, that to me was a very interesting uh, decision that someone signed off on. Navigating the flash drive, they did have a few different test files on there. One thing I really liked is when you click on a file before you start the print, it will display an image of what that model is. So you have an idea of what's going to be printing before you hit print. And that's just something that I hope we get to as in 3D printing in general, being able to see what you're about to print is much nicer than trying to remember what you named something or if there's different versions, did this one have that? So that is something that it does have. And the first print I ran was just a really simple sort of rectangle with a circle shape on top of it that was kind of in vase mode, but I just wanted to make sure that everything was working with the transit and me getting it set up, so I went ahead and printed it out. The print turned out great. There was no under extrusions, there were no issues, the layers looked really clean, and so I was happy to see that everything seemed like it was checking out, and I instantly had to jump in and do some dual extrusion 3D printing because that is definitely a very unique feature that this machine has that a lot of the printers we've tested out do not have. So I went ahead and loaded a second spool of PLA out and it was time to calibrate the uh, offset of those two nozzles. And to do so is actually very easy. They have a printed uh, or, or a sliced file on there that basically has an X uh, or a target with a square. And so you print those and based off of how aligned the X is in the center of that target, you need to adjust the calibration a little bit. And so the first time I printed it out, I saw that it was slightly off. I went ahead and uh, adjusted it. I just clicked to the right a couple times what I thought it needed and down or, or whatever I felt was appropriate. I printed again and it was even more out of alignment. So at that point, I grabbed my calipers to measure exactly what was needed, reprinted it again and saw that everything was ready to rock and roll. Now I was ready to slice up a dual extrusion print on the computer. The only issue is I don't actually know of too many dual extrusion prints. It's not exactly something I run very often and the sort of cool colored tree frog or octopus thing, I've done those in the dual colored benchy and they're great, but I was really hoping that someone would be able to point me in the direction of some very cool models. The first recommendation I got was of the Kraken Cauldron from Bugman over on Prusa Printers. And being that it was October-ish at this point and Halloween was coming up, it only felt appropriate. 
For the slicer, this printer does take standard G-code, so you can create a profile in really any slicer. However, it's gonna be a bit more complex, especially with the dual extrusion aspect of this printer. Quiddy Print is included on the flash drive for Mac, as well as Windows, that I'm pretty sure is a Kira fork. Due to this, the slicer was very familiar to me, even with its slightly changed UI. The downside is that Kira has not played nice on the M1 Mac for some time, so I did end up doing a lot of my initial slicing on the Windows PC that I use for streaming. The profile is all set in the slicer, and it was as easy as importing the dual colored model, clicking which part I wanted with each extruder and slicing. I did make a few slight changes to temperature, but other than that, that was really it and we were off. During the printing of this model, I was pretty nervous because I saw a lot of sort of zits and uh, strings on the prime tower itself, and I haven't done a lot of dual extrusion 3D printing, but it turned out great. I was very, very happy with it, and considering I had just done a brief calibration, I thought that it did a great job of printing out this very cool model. I followed that up with a dual colored articulated lizard, which would have turned out great if one of the links had not come loose from the bed. I went ahead and let the print finish. And after that, I just, I made it where the bed was a hair closer to the nozzle. I hit reprint without changing any settings and it printed out perfectly. After this, I wanted to do something kind of more complicated. When I had reached out on Twitter, 3D Printing World had let me know that he has a couple of awesome dual extrusion lightsabers. And one of them that was over on Things was Leia's lightsaber. And I just saw it and knew that I had to print it. It looked amazing. I had a protopasta bronze filament and a polyalchemy sort of silvery gray elixir that was nearly perfect for the color profile. And so I went ahead and downloaded that model and sliced it up. I did add an ooze shield as well. So you have the prime tower, which primes the nozzle. Then you have the ooze shield, which I just had to prevent any sort of strings or drops from landing on the actual model itself. It's sort of like a cocoon for your model. And I hit print. I watched it for a couple of hours and everything seemed to be going really well. And so uh, at some point I went to bed because it is a very long print. I don't remember offhand exactly, but it was probably close to a full day, maybe more. I really, it's been months, I don't remember, but it was a long print. And I checked on it a couple of times throughout the night when I woke up, there is, uh, I didn't mention it, but there is actually a camera inside of here. There was no mention on the product page of a camera, but yes, there is a camera in here. It's a little bit interesting because you can't access the camera from the computer. You have to use some kind of random app uh, that they have at least on iOS. I don't know if there's Android support. And it does let you, um, you can take photos, record, there's night vision. So it's pretty great for being able to see what's happening on the go. You can't control your printer from it. But again, for me, at least if I'm in another room or if I'm out and about, it, it, once you pair the two, you don't have to be on your local network so I could see it and say, hey, Aaron, the print is failing, please stop it now. So um, I, I do think that the camera could have been implemented better, but considering it wasn't even a mentioned feature, it's sort of hard to complain about a camera that you didn't know you were gonna get. At some point in the early morning, I checked the camera again, expecting to see the print going well, and that was not the case. I saw a knocked over prime tower and ooze on the lightsaber. So I hopped out of bed in a absolute panic and I tried to save the print. I basically uh, stacked some things under the prime tower, tried using some strong tape to hold it in place, but because it had clearly happened a few hours ago, the prime tower was much shorter than where the model was at and it, it was a lost cause. I had to kill the print and I was sad, I was very sad. But I had to try it again. The lightsaber was printing out so well before that prime tower fell over. I knew that if I could see it through, it would be absolutely epic. And I just hadn't considered that the prime tower is sort of like a vase. It's not quite vase mode because it's not just one parameter. There was, I think, two or so parameters, but as it gets taller, it's going to wobble more. And um, what I ended up doing was taking that prime tower, giving it, I think, a thicker wall and making it larger so it had a you know bigger footprint and I hit reprint and yes that does mean I wasted more filament but wasting a bit more filament on the prime tower is better than wasting the entire model itself wasting is not good in general but again out of the two it it, it, it was the best option so I went ahead and sliced it again hit print and this time it turned out beautifully and this has got to be one of my favorite models to date. Um, certainly there's an element of the cool factor that it's got the dual extrusion, it just looks great, but the filament, the printer, the model itself, all the things are just incredible with this and it is one of my prized, one of my most prized prints right now, for sure.
After that print, I had no doubt in this printer's ability to do dual extrusion or dual color uh, PLA printing really, really well. That model was probably the most complex thing I would ever throw at it for dual color. So yeah, this thing can definitely handle dual colored PLA. It was around that time that I saw Prusa Slicer 2.4 sort of being teased and they had this new cool feature where you could paint any model and kind of turn a single extrusion model into a dual or multicolor model. The only issue is, is that I don't have a Prusa Slicer profile for this machine and I don't know how to create one, especially having to incorporate the tool change command or, or you know, the raise and lower command after different colors swapping. I, I didn't know where to start. And so I reached out to Quiddy Tech and said, hey, are you guys planning on working on a Prusa Slicer profile? And the next morning I woke up and I had a Prusa Slicer profile in my inbox. So I downloaded that, I imported it into Prusa Slicer and I began to play around with the painting feature. And that's where I sort of ran into an issue with this machine in Prusa Slicer in that it only allows you to run either an Ooze Shield or a Prime Tower. You can't run both. Uh, and that's not a limitation of the machine, that is the Prusa Slicer. And my experience with this machine so far has been that you can get away with one or the other, but having both of them together gives you much better results. And part of the issue was with Prusa Slicer, when running the Prime Tower, I couldn't figure out a way to effectively make it where the hot end not in use drops in temperature so there's not oozes coming out of it. And so I was able to use the painting feature, I did a video on it, but the print quality results were not that great because of all of the blobs and issues from the filament from the hot end, the other nozzle that wasn't cooling down enough and it didn't have a shield. So the print quality is meh. I'm not going to really fault it on the printer because again, if you could have both of those things enabled, it, it would have looked a hell of a lot better. And another iFast user let me know that they are using Super Slicer and that Super Slicer does allow you to use an Ooze Shield and a Prime Tower. And so as soon as Super Slicer gets that new Prusa painting feature, I am probably going to make that my primary slicer for this printer. Because of all that, I decided to hold off on using Prusa Slicer with this machine after that and the rest of the printing was done with the Quiddy Slicer. After that, I tested out PLA and PVA, and the PVA was two to three years old. I did my best to dry it, but it was definitely still wet when I printed with it. I started off with one small like MakerBot gear print that I found online, and then two much larger stress tests uh, for PVA, and it had absolutely no problem performing. I was concerned, and then I was very pleasantly surprised when I was able to print again two pretty large, pretty long, prints that were encased in PVA and the machine just had no issues with laying it down. After that, I tried a TPU print. It was just a shoe insole that was a pretty decent sized print and the printer also had no problems laying it down. Unfortunately, there was a bit of residue from a previous PLA print on the spring steel, so it did kind of embed itself into the TPU, but that was my fault and not the machine's fault. And as far as extruding it goes, yeah, it, it didn't have any issues extruding it. The TPU I used was 95A Shore Hardness, so it wasn't the world's softest TPU like NinjaFlex, but again, it it should have no issues printing with TPUs. Now at this point, I was ready to switch over to the high temp all metal hot end, and the switching process is actually fairly simple. You unplug those two ribbon cables I mentioned, there's two to three thumb screws that don't require any tools, and then you have to remove one or two screws on the bottom that do require one of the uh, Allen screwdrivers that it came with, and then basically do the opposite. It pops out, pop the new one in, two screws, thumb screws, and the ribbon cables, and you're good to go. Aside from a quick level, you do want to do the fast level to make sure your offset is still correct and that both nozzles offset is correct from the bed. With that tool head, I ran a fairly large lightweight ABS print. I ran a fairly large PTG print. I ran carbon fiber ABS. I ran a very large carbon fiber ABS print, which was the unibody top for the Voron 0.1, which I wouldn't have felt confident with on any I don't think any other machines that I have, and it, it had no issues on this printer thanks to that actively heated chamber. As far as the actively heated chamber, there is a readout for it on the screen, and you have two ways of setting it. You can either set it manually from the printer itself. If you're gonna start a print, you just wanna heat it up, you can do it there. Or in the Quiddy Slicer itself, there is a value for that, so you can uh, input it there and have it heat up before your print starts if you are printing with a material that needs that. Since this printer had very little issue with most of what I was throwing at it, I just started like, I don't know, trying crazy things. And I tried printing a, it was a dual extrusion print with carbon fiber nylon and glass filled nylon. And it was for a open RC part that I found on Thingiverse. 
and it didn't go all that great. And I think part of it was that the filament um, also had some moisture in it, which nylons are tough to print. Wet nylons are very tough to print, but the uh, main issue I ran into wasn't necessarily extrusion, but just that there were globs and strings and hairs kind of all over it. And even with the prime tower and an ooze shield, it still seemed to um, you know, somehow get through to the part. I played around with settings on that print a little bit to see if I can get better results, but they were pretty close and both of those spools are very expensive and I felt that I had done enough experimenting at this point to just say, okay, it can do this, but it can't do this super well. And so I sort of concluded that dual extruding two different types of nylons is certainly possible, but it is going to be very tricky. The last material that I really wanted to print on this machine, which I have not done yet, is polycarbonate. I don't believe I have any polycarbonate in this big collection and I need to get some in. And I'm actually planning on making a sort of, like we do our filament series, a how to print with polycarbonate filament. And so I will be using this machine, I would say, when I am printing with it. So if you're interested in seeing how it performs, definitely stay tuned for that. And there is still so much more I wanna throw at this machine as far as dual color and more materials and experimentation, but it has been like three months and I've done a lot of printing on it. There's just so many things to cover that I normally don't need or want to cover with the printer. But I do feel like with the many prints I've done in my experience using the machine, I've at least got enough feedback to give you an idea of whether this is a machine that you'd want to consider or not for maybe your application. So first let's go through the things that I really like about the iFast printer and there are quite a lot of them. The large build volume, fully enclosed, active heated chamber, carbon filter, the dual direct drive, nozzle rocking system, the linear rails, the camera, there are, there's, there's a lot of features. And the fact that they give you a slicer that is pretty damn well optimized for this machine based on Cura is something that I really like. Also the fact that it just takes standard G code so that way you can use it with something like Prusa Slicer or whatever your you know, slicers of choice if you wanna configure it, those are all amazing things. Also there is no shortage of accessories from the dry box to the powder coated PEI to the crazy tool head with the, again, dual direct drive, bimetal, hardened steel nozzles, like that tool head probably could sell for a couple hundred dollars and that's probably what it would go for with any of the other machines like the Ultimaker or Raze machine if you needed a full assembly like that. And so the fact that they're including all that in for $2,300 makes it a bargain compared to those other machines. Last time mentioning the actively heated chamber, but I do think that there is no way to sort of hype that up because it's just not a thing. Uh, like I said, I think that if we have this conversation in a year or two, there will be a lot more available now that that patent is no longer existing or it's expired. But as of right now, you are going to be spending two to three X uh, to get a printer with an actively heated chamber unless you mod something. But you know, to have that in this package included with all the other things, it's it gets thumbs ups. Now for the things that I feel can be improved upon. And regardless of the machine, I don't think any 3D printer or machine is perfect. So I always try to find things. And there were definitely a couple things with this printer that I want to point out, or I've pointed out most of them, but point them out again. And first is the filament path that it goes to is not a very long path, but it's just got some drag to it. And when the head is printing, let's say near where the filament comes in and pulls to the other side, you could really kind of hear the tension almost of the spool being pulled. And I just wish that had they lined it with PTFE or had some kind of a guide tube, that would not have been an issue. And it might even be an easy upgrade for them to do. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but that is something that I think should be addressed in a you know next version or in a refresh. Uh, I also think that, you know, again, the firmware with the cold extrusion, it's kind of a QC thing um, that should have been implemented at factory. I'm glad that I caught it and hopefully by now they have patched it, but that can also be a, uh, you know, not a good thing. The flash drive, I'm gonna say it again, the flash drive is just one of the silliest things. I've seen some interesting design choices for flash drive location, but having it here, I mean, if they had a micro SD port here, it would have been no big deal, but a flash drive, which is something that sticks out externally. And then the one they give you is like, you know, a standard size flash drive. It's just, I'm surprised, there it is. Let's plug it in, there we go. Like it's just, it sticks out. Like it's so easy to walk by or bump it when you're opening it. So um, that to me, you know, that's something that should be resolved. They either need to give you a much smaller flash drive or just change the location of that. Next for bed leveling, the three point bed leveling on this machine isn't very difficult to use and it's quite effective. Once you get it stuck in place, I didn't have to adjust it very much other than when I was switching out beds because their thickness is slightly different. But 
At the price point in 2021, if we can have all of these features, then I don't see why we couldn't have had some kind of a probe. I'm sure someone had their reasoning for not doing it. Maybe they don't know how to implement it correctly, or I don't know what the real reasoning is, but um, on a bed of this size, you know, it's certainly something that would have been nice to have. The last thing I did want to point out again is just the firmware there. There definitely is some ambiguity around the firmware and after doing my research, I couldn't find the files hosted anywhere. You actually have to reach out to them to get firmware for the machine when updates come out. And that's just strange to me. It's not something I'm used to. Um, I don't think that for a lot of people that are interested in this style of machine, it's going to be a deal breaker because I think that a lot of the other companies might be doing similar things, but certainly coming from like the more budget hobbyist type machines and looking at this, it's a different way of doing things that I'm not necessarily a fan of. So it is something that you will have to just decide for yourself. Is it a big deal? Is it a deal breaker? Only you can answer that. Overall, Quiddy Tech blew me away with their iFast printer and it definitely surpassed my expectations. I'm so used to seeing marketing mumbo jumbo that doesn't make any sense or doesn't live up to the marketing hype, but this really did and it also had bonuses that made it get extra points that I wasn't even expecting which is not the norm usually if there's a feature they want to blast it not keep it hidden and be like here's this cool thing that it also does or comes with so I can definitely see this machine being used in anything from an educational institution because it's fully enclosed and very capable of different materials to you know an actual business and the ability to switch from something like dual color PLA all the way up to carbon fiber ABS or nylon or polycarbonate makes it sort of a dream for prototyping. I do feel the price might be a bit steep to sort of justify it as a casual hobbyist printer, but even with that, if you got this machine, I'm sure you can offer some local uh, print services and maybe a material that, that people just can't print with their 3D printer or just don't have access to, to sort of get some money back for the printer. And then you've got yourself an awesome machine for whatever hobby stuff that you want to do. After testing out so many different 3D printers that are very, very similar to each other. It is very refreshing to try a 3D printer that is very different than any of the other 3D printers I've personally tested out. And it is pushing the bar as far as what you can do with a desktop 3D printer, if you can call this big thing a desktop 3D printer. And that has been the Quiddy Tech iFast. There is, a, like I said, a ton to cover. We covered so much and there's still more I can get into, but this is, this is a long video. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and that if you had any questions about this machine that I answered them. If I didn't, let me know in the comments down below and I will do my absolute best to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I have no problem reaching out to the manufacturer directly to try to get uh, that answer for you. Also, let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts are about this printer. Again, even if it's not something you'd ever purchase, what do you think? I, I, again, the price tag is large on it compared to a lot of the printers we cover, but for what you get, it really feels like they're giving you a ton of stuff that makes up that additional cost difference between a small, you know, aluminum extrusion based frame printer to something like this. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Deanna from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.